Hello, hello, and welcome to My Sex Bios series of fucking capitalism. Uh, this is the January presentation. Um, for January, My Sex Bios theme is abortion. And uh, jumping off of that, the theme for January's fucking capitalism is uh, reproductive justice, uh, parentheses, Marxist reproductive. Um, we're going to get into what that means. Um, first, a little bit about me. My name is Pierce Delahunt. I've been teaching activist and political education since 2010, um, mostly in a summer camp setting um, and school visits. Um, and I'm uh, just joining my sex bio for uh, this fucking capitalism series. Um, I am a member of a variety of uh, positions of privilege and power, including being an owning class white man. Um, I am not profiting off of this series, any proceeds from uh, joining the fucking capitalism events uh, go to my sex bio and their other staff. Um, but please do join. Uh, it's really good conversations. Um, this is the mini presentation of uh, January. Um, if you join us, then you will be in conversation with others um, in, uh, in the pr question prompts and breakout groups and things like that. Um, this is just the, the portion uh, where I present on the topic to get everyone on the same page and thinking about these things. Great. Um, moving forward from that, uh, let's talk a little bit about political economy. Um, oh, and one thing I want to name is that in the month of January, the Supreme Court ruled that um, even during the pandemic, which that uh, shouldn't be a factor anyway, um, but even during the pandemic, um, people have to show up in person to receive uh, the prescription for uh, the abortion medication, um, which is wrong. Um, and uh, the Supreme Court, it's not the first bad decision that the Supreme Court has made. Um, I want to name that. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, this is uh, the January's edition of Fucking Capitalism, uh, theme of abortion slash Marxist reproductive justice. Um, let's talk a little bit about political economy. What is that? That's just uh, the field of politics mixed with the field of economics. Um, a lot of uh, the mainstream economics uh, presumes itself to be politically neutral, but this is uh, incorrect and impossible. Um, political economy acknowledges that says any uh, political system is going to be embedded in an economic one and any economic system is going to be embedded in a political one. Um, the assumptions that the mainstream field of economics makes are often uh, rightward or capitalist assumptions. Um, and for that reason, uh, I like to frame it that uh, the field of economics tends to push people right and the field of political economy, which encourages critical thinking about the political system and economic system both, uh, tends to encourage people leftward um, because people are actually thinking critically and we'll go into why uh, that might push them leftward. Great, so there are two uh, grand structures that a political economy can take. There is socialism and there is capitalism. Um, socialism is when the workers control, capitalism is when the owners control. Um, notice that in that differentiation, there is, I've said nothing about government, I've said nothing about uh, uh, private business. Those are just, that's just a different thing. Um, socialism versus capitalism is different from government versus private business. Socialism is not just whatever the government does. Capitalism is not just whatever private business does. Um, you can have a socialist business and you can have a capitalist government. And we do here in the United States. Um, great. So socialism is when the workers control. Capitalism is when the owners control. Um, they are in a constant tug of war over this control over the means of production. That's what the control <clears throat> is about. Um, the means of production uh, can be in a business, it can be in a government, it can be in whatever community setting you have, um, but, uh, but who controls the means of production is what determines what kind of political economy we have. Now notice this is not a binary, it doesn't mean um, there is a clear line that defines uh, how what counts as how much power or control either group have, right? Um, that that's just a constant struggle, and there are constant 
uh, ways that people are trying to vie for power um, in sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, how, and that can look all kinds of different ways. And there are all kinds of different models of socialism and of capitalism, um, but that is the fundamental uh, differentiation. Um, what are the means of production? Examples include land, knowledge, materials, bodies, and labor, uh, especially uh, emphasizing that one. Um, the reason that I emphasize that one is that that is what determines whether someone is working class or owning class. Um, working class or the proletariat are the people who do not have uh, access to or power over any means of production except their own labor. That's the way that they uh, generate income for themselves is by selling their labor. Um, whereas the owning class has access to means of production that they can rent out. Um, that may be just money. Um, if, if you are an inheritor uh, like myself, um, that money can go into uh, investments um, and you don't have to work and you don't even have to, uh, technically you're, you're renting out the money or lending money um, and you can just let that generate an income for you. Um, or if you have, if you own land, you can rent out land. Or if you own a factory, you can then have people do work on the factory and then you profit off of their labor. Um, and that would make you a capitalist or part of the bourgeoisie. Being pro-capitalism does not make you a capitalist. What makes you a capitalist is if you have a uh, means of production that you are profiting off of rather than your own labor. Um, so that's the working class or proletariat versus the uh, owning class or bourgeoisie. Um, and some examples of means of production. Uh, to clarify that, uh, personal property is different from private property. Personal property, one example, being the house that you live in and personally use. That house that you live in is not a means of production. Uh, private property, on the other hand, that would include the house that you rent out and profit from, but you do not live in that house. Um, and the fact that you do not live in that house, but you're profiting off of it, that makes that house a means of production. So when, when socialists talk about seizing the means of production, they're not talking about your house, they're not talking about your laptop, they're not talking about your toothbrush, they're talking about the, uh, the private property specifically. Um, so socialists are not out for anyone's personal property, that's different. Um, great, that covers a lot of the socialism versus capitalism uh, uh, differentiation and tensions. One thing that I want to highlight in the context of my sex bio, which is all about uh, sexuality and sexual autonomy and, and all that good stuff, um, is that that brings us to a differentiation between socialist feminism and capitalist feminism. Um, so capitalist feminism, we'll start with that one, uh, says that uh, the way to achieve feminism is to give everyone uh, gender inclusive uh, women and trans and queer folk um, the equal opportunity to climb that corporate ladder. Um, and once that equal opportunity is achieved and people have different ideas about whether it has already been achieved or not, um, then if you are living in poverty, it's your own fault. It's not the fault of sexism. Um, on the other hand, socialist feminism says, um, not only is that not enough, we need to abolish poverty itself. Um, that poverty will always affect marginalized groups, including uh, women and trans and queer folk disproportionately. But even if they didn't, uh, just a hetero cis man uh, dying of poverty is not particularly feminist either. Um, and so in order to abolish poverty, we need to abolish private property because that is actually the cause of poverty um, is uh, the private property uh, gatekeeps the means of production away from being democratically controlled. Um, awesome. Uh, so just to clarify, if this were, uh, if you were in the presentation with me, I would be pausing for questions and all that kind of thing. And I do encourage you to come and attend. And if you have any questions, you, I'm very accessible. Um, and I encourage you to join my sex bio Slack where, uh, these slides are made available for, for everyone. And, uh, and you can ask us questions. Great. So that's, uh, capitalism versus socialism and political economy. That's the context of what we're going to be discussing. But this theme, the theme is uh, abortion slash reproductive labor. Um, and we're going to take a look at two different ways to understand reproductive labor. So there is the 
I think, more mainstream understanding of that phrase of uh, reproduction of humans, um, which would fall under the healthcare and reproductive justice uh, in, in that context, um, which deals with pregnancy and medical labor and midwifery, um, for examples. Um, that's the uh, idea of, of reproductive labor in the mainstream. But I want to uh, introduce a Marxist concept of reproductive labor, um, which has been uh, developed a lot by people since Marx, uh, some really awesome Marxist feminists uh, doing really great work. And, uh, and I'll go into some resources. Um, but uh, Caliban and the Witch is a really great uh, uh, resource on that. Um, it's a little bit more academic, but there's a lot of commentary on it from podcasts and YouTubes and things like that as well. Um, but reproductive labor in a Marxist sense talks about what does it take to reproduce the labor itself. Um, and so uh, reproductive labor in that sense is any labor that allows you to show up for work the next day, that's unpaid. That's important. If, um, you know, the, some examples here are eat and sleep and house chores uh, and, and play, which is restorative so that you can continue to show up to work. House chores I emphasize because that's like the bulk of the conversation around reproductive labor, and it's often very gendered. Um, but uh, if I were to cook and clean um, the house so that either myself or my partner uh, could show up to work the next day, or sometimes my children, right? Um, that would be reproductive labor. But if I hired someone to do that for me, um, that the work that they are doing would not count as reproductive labor strictly in that sense, because it's it's plain labor that they're being paid for, um, or, or uh, more traditionally ana analyzed labor, right? Um, so reproductive labor is that unpaid labor that allows people to show up uh, for work the next day. Um, why do I m make this uh, addition to the concept of reproductive labor? Why am I bringing this up in this context? Um, partly because I think it's a concept that we would all benefit from understanding, but partly because it's a jumping off point from the idea of reproductive labor at large. And I'm going to be asking in the present, in the, the breakout groups with the question prompts about your relationship to reproductive labor. And maybe you think you don't have a relationship to right, the healthcare world. Um, so I'm trying to give you different ideas of how you might uh, respond to this question. Um, so I just want to uh, give you as much to think about in terms of possibilities and directions you can take this um, as, as uh, benefits you. Um, one other thing I want to emphasize in uh, this context is something called nurturant versus non-nurturant reproductive labor. Um, and this I highlight because, again, it's a big part of the uh, reproductive labor conversation, and it's also very gendered, um, as, as most things under white supremacist uh, capitalism. But the nurturant versus non-nurturant reproductive labor refers to, um, right, like if we're thinking of uh, a school, for instance, uh, the nurturant labor at a school would be the teachers or the people in direct contact with the, the students and young folk who are uh, engaged with them, right? The non-nurturant uh, part of that reproductive labor would be the administration side. And typically the people engaged in that nurturant reproductive labor are going to be women or femme, um, where the people engaged in the non-nurturant part of the reproductive labor are going to be uh, men or masculinized. Um, and so uh, that I think is an important uh, tension to talk about and name there as well. Um, of course, those are all generalizations. Um, but so that gets at some of the concepts that we're uh, going to be talking about. Um, and if you were in uh, the January uh, presentation of fucking capitalism, then uh, you would be engaged in these prompts, which I'm just going to name for you so you can think about them on your own. Um, the first breakout prompt is how has or does capitalism affect your sexuality and reproductive health? Um, something to think about. If you uh, were unsure, then that would be something that we could discuss in, in the group um, or whatever your, your comes up for you. Um, the second breakout prompt uh, is how has or does reproductive justice affect you and your sexuality? Um, so the, the first one was how to has or does capitalism affect your sexuality and reproductive health? The other one is how specifically does reproductive justice affect you and your sexuality? Um, 
so that is those are the breakout prompts um and uh and then we would discuss those and uh and move from there um and any questions people have about the presentation i'd go into um just the final slide for y'all uh is going to be some resources that uh, i'll just walk you through here um on the left hand box uh, that's the resources around the specific conversation of capitalism versus socialism, just a broader contextual analysis. Uh, I want to highlight that the glossary comes from a group called the Black Socialists of America, really awesome group and really awesome resource in general, their whole website. But that glossary, I think, is really well done. Um, it's written in a very fun way. Um, and if there are any terms that you come across that you don't understand, I think that that's a really great place to, to go to, to for help with those. Um, and then also to highlight the video from Richard Wolf on 21st century socialism, um, that Richard Wolf does a lot of really great uh, speaking on the topic in general, but, um, but that video in particular is my favorite introductory video for the topics at large. I think there's a really good mix of history and analysis that, uh, that help people understand everything in, in general and like why we have the ideas that we do, um, even if they are misconceptions. Um, excellent. So then on the right, uh, we have the resources dedicated to this specific month's theme. Um, the first two orgs are two really awesome orgs dedicated to um, reproductive justice and or health care. Um, so the Abortion Care Network is a really great group. They actually provide uh, more abortions in this country, the U.S., um, than Planned Parenthood does, but far fewer people know about them. Um, the part of the reason for that is that they're a network of independent clinics, right? So they're not, um, they're not like a, a franchise in the same way that Planned Parenthood is. Um, but uh, what's also really awesome about them is that in order for an independent clinic to join, they have to agree to uh, certain uh, uh, standards, including an anti-racist standard, um, which is really awesome. Um, and one of the benefits that they offer independent clinics, right, is that if you're a small clinic, you, you're you not going to buy things in the kind of bulk you would if you were a massive uh, uh, organization. So Abortion Care Network will uh, buy in bulk so that they can get those discounts and then pass them on to the independent clinics. So that's just one example of uh, some, how they benefit the independent clinics. Um, the Fourth Ease Vinegar Collective is um, a really awesome group that helps organize people around uh, their own healthcare at a personal level. Um, they they offer a variety of things to help you basically create your own medicines, including uh, EpiPens and HIV treatments. Um, and I believe that they also uh, have guidelines on how to go about uh, abortion medications. Um, but in general, they're they're really great for healthcare. Um, so then I'm going to put forth two books. Killing the Black Body is a, a book on the intersection of reproductive justice or injustice and racial justice or injustice. Um, and uh, it is actually written by the mentor of the director of the Abortion Care Network. Um, really good stuff in there. Um, that's Dorothy Roberts is the, the author. Um, and uh, it's a heavy read. It's not it's not a, a hard read in terms of uh, being hard to understand or academic or anything like that. It's just a heavy read where, um, you know, after uh, so many pages, you might need to, to process. Um, Caliban and the Witch, that's a, another great book. Uh, that one's written by Silvia Federici. Um, that's a heavier uh, read in terms of the academic sense, the language, um, but really good stuff on how uh, the... Uh, witch hunts of Europe pushed and and the stigmatization of of women and especially women in in uh, healthcare roles and and uh, the like um, how that pushed the transition from feudalism into capitalism and uh, and why capitalism is then built on uh, the patriarchy and the subjugation of of women especially um, in their own abilities uh, to to own their own bodies and, and uh, support each other in that way. Um, so that book is a little more academic, but there is a fantastic podcast uh, called Book on Fire that every season they go through a book and one of the seasons they went through that book. And it's a fantastic way to access that, that information and that discussion and conversation. Um, strongly recommend that one. Um, 
then uh, two videos for you on the topic of abortion specifically. Uh, Philosophy Tube hosted by Abigail. Uh, she's just a really <clears throat> great YouTuber. Um, and uh, she has one on uh, abortion that's, uh, that is done in a very theatrical way. Um, and Shanalika, one of my favorite YouTubers, uh, they do really great work in general, but that, uh, that one on abortion is, uh, is a strong one, um, especially for this, this theme and conversation. And then the perfect victim one, I like to bring that up in the context of, uh, of this conversation around abortion and reproductive justice, because one of the ways that the right will uh, justify injustice and attack movements is by pointing out ways that uh, victims and or survivors have, uh, have demonstrated themselves to be not credible or, or in, in some other way problematic, um, where uh, one of the reasons that they can mobilize around abortion as effectively as they do is that a fetus is in that context the, quote, perfect victim, in that they have not been uh, relationally involved with others by virtue of their of of their not having the full history and life and personhood of of uh, of a born and grown human, that um, that then uh, they they have never behaved problematically in that way, um, and so uh, there's a lot of really interesting analysis around uh, being the perfect victim and what that means and how. Uh, trauma surviving is uh, is is going to present itself in ways that are not uh, perfect, um, that are not not fully relational and, and can be problematized. But that doesn't mean that their trauma wasn't real, right? Um, but that's something that the the right will will weaponize. And so, in a similar fashion, then they have weaponized uh, fetuses as quote unquote the perfect victim in that way. So that's why I bring that up in this context. Um, so those are some of the resources. I hope you check them out. Um, these talks will be made publicly available, um, but uh, the slides are uh, in Slack right now and you can join there. Um, and uh, and you can always join for these fucking capitalism talks or any of the other uh, uh, series that My Sex Bio offers. Fucking capitalism is offered every other Thursday, um, the second and fourth uh, Thursdays of the month. Um, and, uh, and we'll be discussing uh, there. Um, and then My Sex Bio also has a couple different other series on uh, your own, uh, more maybe more personal or applied uh, uh, sexualities and, and how to explore those, which are also really great. Cool. So my name is Pierce Delahunt. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I hope you uh, check out our work. Cheers.